Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mary at the IMP, and Mariah is here with me. Um, I have everyone muted right now. Um, I'm going to um, run through and um, mention everyone who's on the call today and then introduce our presenter. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us for the June IMP Peer Share call about ongoing mentor training. Um, Allison Horn from Teammates is going to lead the call today. And special props to her because she stepped in at the last minute because our original moderator is was sick at the last minute. So thanks, Allison, for, for leading the call today. Um, Dave is on from Foster Grandparents Siouxland. Um, Diane is on from Boost in Sioux City. Jamie is on from the uh, Reach and Rise at the Y in Dubuque. Lynn Carroll is on from Heart of Iowa, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Uh, Rita is on from Boost as well. Val's on from Independence. Did I, did I miss someone? I see, the, I see Karen just joined the call too from um, Everybody Wins here in Des Moines. I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone again. Um, somebody's got some feedback. So today we're going to talk about the ongoing mentor training, why it's important, different formats that are used, topics that people cover, successes and challenges. And the uh, key word here is that it is a discussion. <laughs> and uh, we'll get to questions. Um, this is meant to be interactive and it is peer share. I'm just leaving a little bit here, but then I want to hear everyone's ideas. Don't forget that you do have the chat box there, but um, I do encourage people um, to, to speak up and share their ideas and ask questions. And um, we'll encourage um, Allison to call on people too, because if it's a silent call, that's really no fun, and that's not really much of a peer share call. So thanks for participating. So um, there's a lot of research about mentor training and youth on outcomes. Um, we know that um, besides the length of the relationship, um, retaining our mentors, the um, the mentor training feeds into that relationship and also into the quality um, and um, the, the length of relationship, as I said. And obviously that leads to positive youth outcomes. So there is a great, this is just citing one study. Um, there are, there's a lot of research out there about the mentor training, the quality of the mentor training leading to positive outcomes in the mentoring relationship. Um, just a reminder about the standards around training. Um, the first benchmarks are about the uh, Pre-match training, we, uh, minimum of two hours in person, um, and there are some required training topics and content that are listed, a lot of them around risk management um, and about just uh, the, the program design as well. And program um, using training practice and materials that are used in empirical research and are evaluated. And then their enhancements for the mentor training is really what we're talking about today. Um, E32, that the program addresses these following post-match training topics, um, developmental functioning, of how it affects the mentoring relationship, um, culture, gender, race, religion, socioeconomic status, and other demographic characteristics of the uh, mentor and mentee, how they affect the mentoring relationship. Um, it should also cover topics tailored to the needs and characteristics of the mentee, especially if you run a particular um, particular type of mentoring program focusing on certain youth that might be um, in particular, but obviously each individual mentee as well tailored to their needs. And um, just closure, closure procedures, that's just a reminder um, that closure is part of um, the entire relationship. So you talked about that in um, pre-match training and, and as you go on to, um, to, to continue to talk about closure. So. Um, Another enhancement is program uses training to continue to screen monitor, screen monitor, our screen mentors. Don't forget that screening is an ongoing process as well. And then um, the last enhancement is about mentee and parent guardian training, which is really not um, what we're talking about today. So any questions about the elements or comments on that? You can raise your hand, you can unmute. Or you can put something in the chat box. And if not, we'll move on to 
Allison will now lead an engaging discussion. Let me reiterate, a discussion, participation. Thank you. So Allison, I'll turn it over to you. I've unmuted you. Thank you, Mary. Um, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? I have everyone else muted, but we can hear you, so I think we're good. All right, I think you can hear, you can hear me okay now. Um, I'm Allison Horn. I've been with the Teammates Mentoring Program um, for a number of years, and my primary role is match support, um, which we have um, kind of found to be really important in, um, of course, the retention of the match, but also in the whole um, overall sense of what a mentoring program is. Um, what we've learned along the way is that mentors really need the same kind of support um, from us that we're asking them to provide for their mentees. So the way that I look at ongoing training is reminding mentors that they're not alone, um, that they're supported in their journey. Um, training isn't just policy and procedure, it's really about gauging um, where the match is, what kinds of resources that the mentors need. And Mary, if you want to go to the next slide, we'll talk maybe a little bit about how we implement those. Um, one of the things that we um, do each year is we um, survey our mentors and we ask a lot for their feedback. Um, we do training evaluations for new mentor training, but we also do evaluations throughout the match. And one of the things that we've found is that mentors are really looking for learning opportunities. Um, specifically for where they are in their match and also the particular needs that they um, feel they may need for match support. So we found that a lot of mentors were looking for much more than just reminders of what policy and procedure were. They were looking for specific areas of support. And we know that as a mentoring program, um, we don't have all the answers. And so we've relied heavily um, on our community experts. And we have developed some really phenomenal partnerships by asking community experts to provide what we like to call our mentor academy sessions. Um, and within our organization, um, we require training every three years, but we encourage training um, on an annual basis um, for a couple of reasons. One, of course, reminding the mentors that they're not alone, but also because training is screening and really being able to gauge where the mentor is at the current time in their match, what are other areas of support that they might need. So we developed mentor academies. Um, we used to refer to ongoing training as renewal training and we found that a lot of people associate renewals with like driver's licenses and the DMV and we didn't necessarily have the most positive response um, to the term renewal so we changed that language to academies and we have really tailored these to be um, very diverse in the way that we give information um, to our mentors. So some of these sessions um, that we've implemented are um, as fun as um, using humor in the mentoring experience or even um, gauging overall wellness um, for the mentor. Um, providing some um, information and support for mentors really on, a, on more of a, um, a personal mentor level. All the way to um, we've had a financial literacy session, we have sessions around learning about strengths and growth mindset, and we also have sessions um, with our local um, Health and Human Services that provide understanding poverty training. We've had a panel on um, supporting mentees with an incarcerated parent. And we've worked closely with Grief's Journey, um, providing sessions around understanding grief and loss. And we know that grief is not just limited to death. It could be a situation of um, separation, whether that was deportation, um, whether that was incarceration, divorce. So we've had a lot of different sessions. And what we try to do is offer these monthly sessions, um, three to four sessions per month, and they are um, open to all of our mentors at any season or stage. They could be a brand new mentor who maybe has only been mentoring for three or four months, or they could be a mentor who's been mentoring for three or four years. And um, encouraging them to choose some to attend, um, making them diverse, but offering the same sessions four times per year and each month offering four different academy sessions so that they could choose what might fit them. One of the really positive things that we have found again um, along with what happens in the mentoring relationship when mentors are part of these um, ongoing academy sessions they often hear from other mentors that they're not alone. So it's a great building of teamwork and a great building of understanding and support um, on the mentor to mentor level. 
So a lot of times when we start these sessions, we will ask our mentors to share what's a joy that they've experienced in the mentoring journey and maybe what's a challenge. And that really helps our coordinators to understand um, where the mentor is, what kinds of things they may need for additional support, but it also helps other mentors understand that they're not alone. Um, so if they are struggling, um, maybe at a current um, developmental level or a season of the mentoring journey, um, having another mentor share their story often can be very encouraging on that peer level. So we um, just simply use Sign Up Genius, which is free. Um, we use those and we send out a monthly email to all of our mentors, letting them sign up via the Sign Up Genius link um, and having those sessions in some different areas um, around the um, Omaha area and around other areas so that they are able to attend those that might fit their schedule. Most of them are over the lunch period um, and we ask that mentors bring their own lunch. We kind of call it a lunch and learn. Some of the sessions have been 4 to 5 p.m. and we've had requests um, for early morning as well just so that we meet the needs of, of each of our mentors. So that's something that we've put into place um, based on what we heard from our mentors. They were looking for opportunities to network. They were looking for opportunities to learn about different um, subjects. But also, every one of these academies has about five, 10 minutes of policy review. So anytime we gather our mentors, we try to make sure that we are covering our bases and reminding them about the safe, healthy boundaries within the mentoring experience. Um, what we've heard from some of our coordinators is that our seasoned mentors um, sometimes along the way may even forget about what policies are, or they may feel that the match um, has built trust and because trust has been built, perhaps the policies don't apply to them anymore. So one of the things that we really try to do is um, incorporate some policy review in a fun way um, so that mentors are engaged. Um, adult learners, um, in my experience, are very similar to um, third and fourth grade learners. They need to have fun, engaging sessions. Um, they also need to be heard. Um, and we try to make those um, an opportunity um, for our mentors program wide. So that's a little bit about how we incorporate um, what we call our ongoing trainings and we call them academy sessions. We like to make these chapter specific as well. Anytime that we can have a graduating, we are a school-based mentoring program, um, so we honor our graduates. Anytime that we can have a graduate share their testimony or a mentor share their testimony, that's also very helpful in the ongoing trainings. Just kind of reminding everybody um, that there is a, a great goal at the end. Um, and sometimes at different stages or seasons of the mentoring relationship, it can be hard to remember that, um, that just to hang in there and, and um, to feel supported. So I want to pause a, sec a second here and open it up to find out um, within your programs, what are some of the um, ongoing training opportunities that you provide? Or if you have any questions about um, any of the information that I just shared. Everyone is unmuted now. And I'll ask you a question. Um, I know you require the training, and I, I know that a challenge that a lot of programs have is just um, is getting folks to the ongoing mentor training. Um, and you mentioned for some of the reasons, like that they just feel really comfortable and and don't want to go over policy and that kind of thing. So um, talk about your attendance, or just being upfront with folks about the requirement and what kind of feedback you get about that. Sure. We have a lot of mentors um, who at times may say, um, I'm very familiar with the policy. I don't need a renewal session. Um, we try to um, we, we try to be very careful about the requirement language. Um, we'll put information out there and we do it new mentor training. Um, let them know that they're required to attend training once every three years but encouraged annually. And then we also let them know that these are topics that help support them where they are. Um, so we, we set the stage from the very beginning in new mentor training that this is not only an expectation but a resource. Um, we do have a lot of our resources tagged online um, and a mentor resource library on our website that helps to tie these resources in. 
if we have some mentors who maybe are struggling um, to understand why we'd like to have them come back, one of the ways that I have found to be very helpful is I will specifically ask a mentor to share about their journey because they bring as seasoned mentors such a wealth of experience. So whether that mentor attends a new mentor training session or they attend one of the academies, I ask them to come and honor us with their presence um, and honor us with their expertise about their um, their mentoring journey. And sometimes that's a little bit of a different approach that helps for um, people to reconsider um, the option. I think one of the most important things is keeping them fun, um, making them something that they will go and tell their other mentor friends about. So if it's something that they got something out of, um, we encourage them to share that with others. Um, we do design a few of these to be um, set up so that it can be chapter specific, um, but also we kind of open it up so that it could be anybody from any area. And I think sometimes just being able to hear one another um, helps to build that rapport and encouragement to attend these sessions as well. I don't see any other questions right now. Well, I would love to hear um, some of the ways that other um, mentoring programs are incorporating ongoing training. I feel as a trainer I'm always learning from, um, from others and um, would love your feedback and your ideas on the ways that you incorporate ongoing training in your um, mentoring program. Val had volunteered to share. I'll unmute you, Val, now if you want to talk about some things that you've done. I sure can. Um, some of you may have heard about Mentor Monday. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, some of you may have heard me talk about Mentor Monday. I'll just offer a few more details today. Um, I have offer uh, training also once a month on the first Monday of every month at the local coffee shop. And this is my, I just finished my second year. Um, we had, we had probably between 10 and 15 people almost every month. Um, what we encouraged them to do and we promoted it was come share your mentoring moments and have a dessert on us. And then I gave them postcards, the first session um, of, that said the dates and times of all the sessions for the school year. And then um, it was only canceled if there was no school that day for bad weather. Otherwise, we had it. Um, we start in October because we have the back to school parties and the rematches in September. So we start in October. Um, last year, what I did in October was uh, getting to know you, and I did a YouTube of the famous King and I song. Um, and so they had they had smiled and laughed. So I was hearing what Allison was saying about keeping it fun. Um, we had activity sheets for the mentors and students, so when they went back to school to start meeting with them every week, they had a getting to know you sheet for them, things that had changed over the summer, and talked about some goals for that year. And in November, we had them bring their favorite um, recipe and share what their first one of their favorite Thanksgivings. And I'm sure some of you have heard about the lefty righty game, and it's, you can go online and get these activities where you have to go left then you go right to one person's reading and one of the mentors had brought that to me ahead of time and said how about we do this at our next meeting we really laughed hard and it was a lot of fun um, and everybody got a prize that completed it without um, forgetting which way they were going um, in December they wanted me to start bringing in guests so I brought in the superintendent of schools and our lunch food supervisor and we talked about um, what, what the school looks like in five years and how the lunch program serves the kids. Um, we did a group photo for mentoring month because January was coming. I wanted to be prepared for that. Um, and then in January, we just did fun activities and talked about what they did over the holidays. Played um, buckets, you know those buckets you can get with snowman balls? You just have snowballs that you play. Um, so they all made one of those with cotton balls to take to their mentor, mentee. Um, then in February, we had two people come in from the school and talk about volunteering and how important it is and what they can do. Um, somewhere other than myself, we had a teacher come in as well. 
in March we had pathways. Um, in April we had um, building direction for families in our local Department of Human Services. And then May we did an end of the year wrap up and we talked about what we like, what we like best, what we want to bring back. And when I did that follow up from the information, I really liked bringing in the community's organizations. They really like Pathways, DHS, um, and Building Direction for Families. They really liked their presentations. Um, the year before, I think I'm going to go back and do something like this again. Um, depending upon how many buildings you have and if you're only a school-based program or not, I did a building safety orientation. What does it look like if there's a lockdown or a lockout or a tornado drill or a fire drill? Um, how can they be comfortable in that situation? And we also shared the stages of a mentoring relationship. Um, we also did a session on bullying one month. Um, one session I did on effective strategies for treating the angry and anxious child. Um, we had the mayor come. We invited them for our January meeting. Um, we also did domestic violence. And then one month we did game day. And we brought four or five games, let them pick the ones they didn't know how to play. And they love that. Um, and then we had our public library come and talk about the summer reading program. So the kids could um, talk to their mentor about it. And the mentor could ask good questions, you know, ask about the summer reading program. How do you do your reporting? What books you're going to read? Those kind of things. So that's some of the things I've done the last two years. Very fast and furious. I gave you that information. Um, and then we did a survey at the end of the year. And we have some topics ready for next year. Anybody want to share what they think or if they've tried this? Val, well, this is uh, Allison. Yeah. So that I'm understanding, um, you do this as a match, right? No, this is only for the adult mentors. Only for the adult mentors, okay. Yeah, once a month on the first Monday of the month. Everyone is unmuted now for questions for Val. I know she just listed a whole bunch of topics. If you have questions about. If not, um, I have a question in the chat. I'm not sure if everyone's looking at that. Um, Lynn had asked about if the mentor trainings were face-to-face. -face. Um, and Allison, yes, said they were in person. Um, Lynn, I've unmuted you now. Did you have um, any insight about other ways that you've delivered trainings to mentors besides being in person? Um, we have a new um, website, and that is an option for us to have a, a, a section or a tab where we can put information in for our bigs or some kind of basics, and that that was one thing I was considering it was how much of the training kinds of things we can put in there for just resources or maybe our policies on things that they can use for a resource that's all and in counting that as training if we're if we're referring those people to that along the way Lynn this is Allison we've had a lot of discussion about um, online training options and and we really I think we we are coming closer to that as an option because it is so much more convenient. I think one of the pieces we're struggling with is how we gauge, um, well, first of all, the screening piece for us. So that's that's a continual that doesn't you know just start at the beginning, but it's an ongoing. So the screening piece and having that face-to-face -face interaction, but also um, you know trying to gauge what they get out of it and if they're attending. And we've looked at a lot of different. Um, a lot of different resources um, as far as online technical um, options. Um, they're kind of all over the board when it comes to expense and when it comes to um, I think probably user friendliness. Our, our, um, we have a, a, a population of uh, mentors that would like online and we have a population of mentors who would not like online but I think it's something that we're really thinking about. I am super curious um, if, if you um, have any thoughts on how people have responded to that or um, what the, um, I guess, the match support person feels 
Um, how do they continue that? Because I know that you guys do such a great job with match support on the individual match level. Um, so a lot of that screening probably happens through there. But I'd like your thoughts on on the online piece. I, the online piece, I believe, is is primarily for them to best have access to things. Um, for our website and so that's an option with our website um, we do have some things through big brothers big sisters of america that are trainings that we ask um, bigs to go to and have gone through a certain number of those and they are online trainings and as a administrator of those i can see that when those were completed um, our school-based coordinator really visits face to face with all of our mentors every month. Our um, community based would, a great deal of that is over the phone. But we do host um, periodic events or activities that they're invited to be a part of and and that's where a lot of that face to face time really happens especially for our community based. So for example we just had um, Big Brothers Big Sisters night at the girls softball game at the high school level um, last week and we have five of our varsity players are school-based bigs for us but there were all kinds of bigs and littles that came and were introduced at the game it gave us a great face-to-face -to, -face to chat with them during the game to see what's going on it gives us an opportunity to check in with the kids and some of those the parents came along so we were able to cover all kinds of bases right there in a short time um, and we also have another, we have a fishing event coming up, so it'll be another face-to-face -face time just to check in and see how things are going. Face-to-face -face is the ideal. It really is because you, um, you get, you, you see the faces and the responses are real and um, we do not like um, emails for our match support. I think that um, it can be a, it's not always interpreted correctly on either end as to how it is um, they're responding and what that response is supposed to mean. And I think you, you, for safety reasons, you need to hear their voice. You need to ask the questions right there and then. And you also need to do that in a face-to-face -face manner once in a while. We just don't do face-to-face -face all the time with our community-based. I totally agree. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to call on the Sioux City folks. I think we have three folks from up there, Big Brothers and Sisters and Boost. Um, what topics have you found to be helpful with the ongoing mentor training? I think you are, you're self-muted, some of you. I've unmuted you on this end. Okay. How about challenges? We talked a little bit about just getting uh, mentors to ongoing training. What other challenges have you run into with on, with this topic? Yeah. Ellen, do you want to share any challenges you've found? Oh, every day is a challenge around right here. Uh, challenges with training of mentors, correct? Yeah, yes. Unless you want to get into something else. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's just one of those daily things. I learn something every day. Um, I think a challenge is always in the recruitment process, um, but but once you have them, I believe you know sometimes it's busy people that volunteer, and so actually finding a time to connect with them is probably the challenge. Um, you know, to return the phone call so that you can talk with them or to, and you know, it, that's pretty normal with most things and most people, I believe. So that's probably one of our biggest things that we always have to keep working at. We have to be persistent in following through on the contact. Thanks, Ellen. 
Karen, do you have anything to share about your ongoing training or frustrations? All of, all of the same. Um, because we're in four counties, it's kind of challenging for us um, because most of what we would um, have provided would be here in Des Moines. So most of our volunteers from the um, uh, other counties probably don't want to travel. And we don't have funding to pay mileage. That's what I was curious about, um, Allison, when you said that since you're covering so many different areas and school districts, you know, you, you guys offer so uh, so many opportunities for training and really, I don't know if you have any more suggestions to help on, on how folks can do that. It's just so, it's so labor intensive on your end. It sure is. Um, and I was actually just going to respond to that. Um, one of the things that we've done is we've been facilitators on site, but we've opened it up to video connection, um, kind of similar to this webinar. One of them that we use is technology called Zoom, which is kind of like FaceTime, kind of like um, Skype, but a little more concise. Um, it provides the opportunity for us to di um, directly link to um, their screen, be able to see their participants. Um, so I, I've done a lot of my Growth Mindset Academy sessions um, via Zoom so that whether there's a chapter, um, you know, 500 miles away that wants to get online and learn a little bit more, we've got that coordinator there in place to gather the mentors. I send out the materials ahead of time. I kind of give them an idea of what we'll be talking about. And I also send them the PowerPoint slides so that in case we have any technology issues, um, we can at least talk through it. And that's been, I mean, it's not as great as having the group right in front of you, but that's been um, really effective um, for us when we talk about the big, um, the widespread area that we're trying to cover. And then I think, too, really equipping and building confidence of our coordinators on the local level to um, consider their own community experts, um, to have them talk to, um, as Val mentioned, you know, thinking about the local library, thinking about the local community um, experts. One of the sessions we had was called Transitions, where we encouraged all of our coordinators to reach out um, because we're school-based. A lot of mentors um, struggle with the um, transition from elementary to middle or middle to high school. So we just had a panel of principals and some school support staff, um, and that session was called Transitions. Um, that was done on the local level um, from the chapter um, coordinator. And I think, again, it honors the the experts in the community, but it also um, gives an opportunity for partnerships to be connected and made. Um, we have been just amazed at what we've learned about what other great um, community serving um, organizations are um, doing and how much we've learned from one another through the academy learning sessions. Dave, did you have anything to share? I know foster grandparents have a lot of training they offer and opportunities for all of the grandparents to come together. You're self-muted if you have anything you wanted to add. Um, we, we do quite a bit with schools and have different groups come in and talk to them. A lot of similar ideas and activities to what we've heard throughout the day already. Thanks. I know um, generally grandparents don't hit on any problem. Um, they like to get together. That's not usually a problem, is it? <laughs> no, they're always looking for something to do with us. <laughs> Anybody that hasn't had a chance to share or ask a question, we're welcoming a new, um, a very new staff member for Big Brothers Big Sisters. And I'm sorry, um, if you would unmute yourself, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Are you talking to me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, my first name is it's pronounced Cheetah. Um, oh, looks yeah. Welcome. Pronounced, uh, yeah. Um, so I'm pretty brand new to uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters. I started in May, and um, pretty new to the whole mentoring side of of it. Um, came over from Boys Town. Was with Boys Town for a couple months or a couple years. Um, but 
Yeah, I, what was your question? No, I just wanted you to say hi, and so we could. Oh, right now, so okay. I knew your name too. Um, no, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. And um, okay. knowing you came from Boys Town, I think we were obviously he can hit you up for some um, very specific training moving forward. So, no, welcome. We're just glad you joined us today. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody else that hasn't had a chance to share or has a question? I want to thank Val and Alice in particular for all their great ideas today and everyone else asked questions. Um, we did record this and we will share this further. Um, the next peer share call in July is going to be on growth mindset, which I know is a topic that a lot of programs are interested in and are using in different ways. And um, Allison is going to be presenting again from teammates. She stepped in this month and she gets rewarded with doing it again next month. Um, one thing I want to uh, remind you all to be looking for, Public Health is putting together their RFP, which hopefully will be coming out maybe before our July call. I don't know about that, but then the next month. So be looking for that. Um, they'll release it, but I'll also send it out specifically to folks to, um, so we make sure that the mentoring programs apply for their funding. That's the only state funding we have available to our program. So, so look for that. Um, does anyone else have any other questions just in general for us or? For others, Mary, is that coming to us? The, the Iowa Department of Public Health stuff is that just coming on email from you? Um, I will send it out specifically. I don't know what if you're on any list for them or what their release will be. I know they'll probably post it too, but I will definitely be sending it out too, specifically Thanks. directly. Yep. Don't know for sure the date, but it's coming. Well, if there isn't anything else, anybody else have any other questions or comments? We'll wrap up today's call. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.